everybody, today we're going to be doing an Evil Dead Kandarian Dagger. This is a project I've wanted to do a long time. I've actually had the parts to do for a very long time. I had a chicken carcass that I stripped and boiled and bleached the bones for. I had the original model, the eight scale human skeleton model that the original was built off of. And I've had them in a box for a very long time, always on my to-do list. And apparently I waited too long because uh, Trick or Treat Studios came out with their own replica Evil Dead Dagger. And to be honest, the thing that was slowing me down the whole time was recreating the bone blade, the little spinal column tail thing here. Uh, but, you know, I've still got all the parts, so I think I'm going to do an Evil Dead 1 dagger, you know, the one with the aluminum blade. And that's going to be our project today. So here I basically have the guts of my dagger. I had read somewhere that it might have been Book of the Dead, that they had used something called cellulose when building the original one. Uh, it's sort of a um, instant paper mache. Uh, I found this fast mache from the same makers as cellu clay, which I assume is like cellulose. It is also an instant paper mache. Supposedly, this fast mache is supposed to be stronger. Um, I have heard that in thicker areas, if it's too thick, it can crack while drying because it wants to dry on the outside and the inside is still wet. So what I'm going to do is cut up, uh, cut up some dowels. And I'm just going to sort of beef up my handle with some wooden dowels. I've scored it, um, I've cut it so that it can sort of frame the blade itself. And I'm going to bulk up that area so that I don't have to make the entire thing completely thick with the cellu clay or fast mache and risk it cracking while drying. So I'm going to epoxy that stuff into place and get a foundation before I put my coat of the fast mache on there. I've also taken apart my skeleton and pulled out the parts I know I'll need. I know I'm going to need all these. I think I'm going to need all these. I'm not sure. I've got plenty of actual real chicken bones to replace those. I know that these are unique and visible in the actual thing. I've also gone ahead. I don't know if how much I'm going to use of the tiny little rib pieces, but in case I need small ribs, I have those uh, thigh pieces. Definitely going to need some drumsticks. Small, this is from Popeye's Chicken actually. It's not all uh, chicken wings. Obviously there are plenty of wings, but you see the wing pieces are smaller than the drumsticks. Just by a little, but enough where I think it's going to make a difference, especially for the two that kind of make up the hilt area. Not a very good hilt because they point straight up toward the blade, but they are noticeable in that there are two much longer ones on the on the handle. After careful study of screenshots from both the first Evil Dead in '81 and Evil Dead 2, I've sort of, and also from referencing the actual professional prop, I don't agree with everything here, but it's a better reference than nothing because not every screenshot is all that clear. Um, a couple things I have decided is the spine. There seems to be a shortage of spinal column pieces. I read some people say that two skeletons were used to make it, and I kind of believe it, because this pattern you see for the back of the ribs uh, can be found across the top, down at the bottom, and on the front. So I'm kind of short two inches of spinal column of the back ribbed pointed section, but I'm going to use the main front of the spine. I broke off pieces of it. I'm going to use those in these places. I think it'll still be pretty good. As far as the rounded portion of the head goes, uh, this screenshot clearly does show that uh, despite the replica having no ribs, they were intact at least for part of the first Evil Dead, with some of the ribs broken off, as I've broken them off here in an attempt to replicate that look from the screenshot, just because it that's the clearest shot I could get of it. The ribs are broken in that shot, so that's how I'm doing it. This is that shot. See, the back ribs were present at the top and wrapping around. And then, uh, that's why I'm carrying it down on this way through the entire spine. The whole spine can be seen in these images. But aside from the spine, this is the format I've got going down straight from the front as it spans its way out. Uh, obviously some of these are going to be overlapping each other. Uh, I do have some hesitation that my drumsticks are not as big as they could be. These are from uh, Popeye's Fried Chicken, not from a 
big roided up fried chicken. I would think in the 80s they had fairly small chickens to pull from, so maybe it's accurate. But that's what I got. Everything else is a mixture of the bones, uh, real and fake, as best as I can get from the screenshots. That's the format it kind of is going to wrap around exactly like that, with this being the front piece right down the blade. And these are the ones that look most like teeth. Obviously, I don't think anybody put any real human teeth sticking out of it. But uh, these things going crossways through the head certainly can provide that look. Because, uh, well, at least if you have just a quarter inch sticking out, absolutely could look like a tooth. So that's why I've picked these. And these are going to be going horizontally in the head. Otherwise, that's the whole format. Spine, wrap around the belly and the sides, and the teeth. Step one is definitely going to be getting the skull right. If you don't line up the skull right, the whole thing's going to be off. So I'm actually going to glue that in and let that sit overnight before I start uh, the um, you know, actual plaster. So I'm going to be using a Loctite Power Grab Ultimate. It actually is a little squishy. I'm certainly not going to hold it against anyone who wants to use epoxy and make it real, real firm. But um, I've also had some pretty good luck with the E6000 glue. I use that on a lot of projects. So the head is on there. I like the spacing. Uh, it's secured with some power grab, so it's a little flexible still. That flexibility is going to disappear, I assume, when I add that to it. Next thing I'm going to do is take a heat gun, because for this back spine that goes across the top, as you saw in the previous picture, I wanted to have a little more curvature. I don't think I can bend it without it snapping. So I'm going to take a heat gun to it. Fine line you got to dance if you want to take a heat gun to this guy to get some more curvature is your ribs will melt before your spine bends. Uh, I don't have a good solution for that. But I did it. I re-bent the ribs back into place. That's why there's this uh, deformity in this one. But I did get a little more curvature out of it, which is what I wanted. So I guess it's a success. I don't know. Maybe I'll file that down. I don't know. For the bones that look like they're supposed to be human teeth, I've gone ahead and just cut out the middle so that they're each about an inch long. So I can just jam them into the paste and hopefully have them stick. It is important to remember that uh, these bones don't exactly cut. I've been using tin snips. They really splinter more than they cut. But you know what? I don't think that's going to make a difference because uh, they're getting jammed into the paste anyway. So it's not like you need a smooth cut. A little jagged edge will give it a little grip, I think, to help it grab. You will make quite a mess, but um, you'll end up with some things you can just stick right into the paste instead of having to make it go literally all the way through. Time to quit playing around. Ziploc baggie on a bowl. Got my powder, my fast mache powder and some water. Mix these suckers up. to let it sort of dry that first layer because it's not sticking very well to the wood or the plastic I've just clamped it into something that will suspend it in the air and let gravity kind of I don't know hopefully do its thing let it dry keep it away from uh, touching surfaces I can sand down anything that ends up too blobby hopefully it doesn't sag too much and in the meantime since I went and mixed up almost a full pound of the goo I hear this stuff actually can stay in the fridge for quite a long time, which is a reason why it's good that I put it in a Ziploc baggie. I'm just going to pull this back up, roll it up, and throw it in the fridge, save it for later. About two hours later, and this is firm to the touch, but still pretty squishy. I think that's good enough to take it to the next level. Let's keep going and start adding some bones.
overall, I'm actually pretty happy with it. I mean, it might be a little too thick in this area. I suppose I could pull that giant bone out and stick in a little flappy. Scrape out some of that. That's not what I want to happen with that. So, cannot stress enough, every bone in here is not screen accurate, but every bone in here I think looks pretty good. Alright, once again I've got it clamped to a surface so that it can just dry in the air and not worry about anything touching it. I'm actually pretty happy with it so far. What I'm going to do is give it about an hour or two until it firms up. And then I'm going to go back in and squish down the still pliable parts, reveal more bone, and uh, clean up anything I can. But overall, I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. All right, it is still very soft, very wet, very squishy. But I'm going to take this chance to... Sort of give it the old wet rub down. Wipe off the excess. Try to reveal a little bit more of the bones that are in there. Uh, take off some of the excess material. Just, you know, with a little splash and water on it. Rub it with a wet finger. Kind of swipe at it. And get rid of all the example crud there. I want that to be smooth. Coming in on day two, it's actually still pretty soft. It is starting to shrink slightly, so I'm less concerned about it being too thick like I was yesterday when I did it. If it continues to shrink, I'm actually not going to complain at all, except some of the edges along the bones have receded. I hope they hold on to the bone. I can always fill in big gaps with any other kind of modeling or contour putty, so I'm not too worried about that. But, uh... Overall, I'm happy that it is shrinking. I am not so happy that we are a full, I don't know, 30 hours later, and it's still soft enough to squish. So, eh, patience is key. Just keep on waiting. Now, to fill in some of the gaps, I am actually using wood filler because it sands nice, and as you rub it on, you can actually just take a wet rag and it'll smooth right out. So filling in the gaps and reestablishing some of the bone lines is done with wood filler in this case. You could use just about anything you want though, including more of the paper mache. Finally ready to paint. Uh, a lot of people might have argued maybe I should have painted everything before I got started. Uh, no other builders have gone so far as to tint the plaster that they use so that it doesn't even need painted but i was i guess a little hesitant because i wanted to make sure i could actually do it before i went to all the trouble of painting now that i'm very happy with the results it's time to i guess dig in and get painted I'll be using mostly acrylics some black some white some uh umber a couple other shades of brown not pictured here but the main plan is of course to paint up the plastic bones to look more real and maybe then I will darken up the real bones to match the plastic sort of, you know, meet in the middle effect. By no means done, but I got the first coats of everything on. I just put some uh, solid white on the plastic bones with a little bit of a dusting of uh, a brown. And then I went in the crevices with the black. Now it's primed, uh, painted a couple layers. I filled in a lot of the area between the bones. A lot of it has, uh, of course, overflown into the bones, for which uh, on the real bone, I just used a razor blade and kind of scraped it back back a little bit, 
which honestly I think is not going to hurt it given it the more weathered look with the black overflow that's been scraped off. It makes it look more worn. But the plastic bones still do look just unnaturally white even with the dusting of brown. So I'm going to go in with another wash of white and a yellow ochre and give everything a nice wash with that. I think I'm getting there. Did a couple washes of white and that uh, yellowish brown. Now I'm going to go in with a medium wash of dark brown around the edges of everything. Try to clean up those little stray white spots. Overall I am much more happy with how it looks so far. I don't know if all the good details are visible but I am actually going to dull protective coat this real quick and then I'm going to do the final layers of washes to tone everything down. The bones, the plastic bones are still a little brighter than the real ones. But, um, see, so there's a plastic bone dead center. But, uh, they're closer, and I think after a wash they'll be good. One quick note on doing a wash is that when you use cheaper paints, like I do sometimes, when you thin them out with the water, you're not getting even spread of the color. It can create some blotchiness which when creating an unnatural, semi-natural shape, I kind of like here, I kind of like the blotchiness myself, but um, it's not always ideal. So instead of thinning it with just straight water, you might want to just put some flow improver or even mix it into some matte medium. It kind of spreads it out, evenly disperses the color without uh, overpowering anything. So, uh, But I can already tell there's actually more pigment in this wash than any of the last ones with less water and more matte medium that grabs the pigment. This wash is actually lightening up the color underneath the base color, which is not necessarily what I want. I think I'm going to have to do a darker wash here eventually. But I think this will unify the bones a little bit. And I'll do a dark wash in between the bones again. It's a lot of black and darker browns. I did add some black to that and I did go back in over the top and now, like I said, we are getting some, I really like the colors now, especially on the face. we got to see how it dries. You never know how things that are still wet are going to look when they're done being dry. But I think we're getting much closer to where we want to be. So go in with several of the washes that you want first and just remember obviously washes are designed to sink and fill grooves. Uh, don't be afraid to go back over the top and dry brush. Obviously anything you want lighter in color, you will absolutely not want to just put a wash on it. You're going to want to go in and hit the highlights with a dry brush. So I'm, I've got a few little spots where I've got some overflow on my dry brush into my wash. But for the most part, I'm pretty happy with how it's turned out. And uh, I think it is time to make it bloody. I want to make it different from the trick-or-treat one. I want it to look unique and by design the colors are going to be very similar. Now I have made these bones a little darker than is seen on screen in many of the screen caps. Again that is partially by design. I don't mind a grittier prop and also I don't want it to look like I have two of the same thing with just a different blade. I want this prop to look different from the trick-or-treat studio ones. So I'm going to make this one look a little more worn, a little more gritty and bloody. One thing I was kind of experimenting with was some gloss spray paint that I would just uh, blast into this. Some red, good dark red, and then a little brown just to make it a little more gruesome. And then literally I was able to drip it really thin 
and I did some experiments here. It came across a little too thin because it's a bit transparent, but I think that might actually be a pretty good base for me if I do the drip method with the mixed spray paint. And then I can go in over the top and really thicken it up with a nice bright, um, bright enamel. So that's my plan here. Also, uh, some other things you could do is mix some Mod Podge gloss in with some, you know, just regular acrylics. Uh, obviously, a bright red, a deep red is a good foundation. If you want it to be a little bit more gruesome, add a little bit of blue or brown into it. The good part about using the spray paint option is it is really thin. Real thin, so you get a lot of good splatter if you really want to get crazy with it. I'm probably not going to go full-blown splatter, but I'll uh, say just a dab of brown. Not even going to mix it really. I want it to stay uneven, and then I'm just going to pour it right down the blade. Getting half dried chunks is never a bad thing either. Once it's been on the ground a little bit and starts to dry, spread those chunks around. That's what I like to do. Now some of this stuff doesn't really look as good as the rest of it in the other layer. But that's fine. We're going to go in over the top with the enamel. Like I said, we're going to smooth out all that stuff. Or make it more gruesome. Who knows? We're going to, we're going to mess around with it. So I've done uh, just shaking the can at it, get a little more blood splatter on some of this stuff. Obviously this is a risk because if you don't like it, it's going to be a lot harder to clean it off the bone than it is going to be off the blade. The blade you can just use an abrasive and get it back down to bare metal easy. So for the most part, I'm going to be doing the bone with a brush, a little more targeted. But I did do some splatter at the base. I wanted to make sure I got some splatter at the bottom. And overall, I did decide to go not so much with the fresh blood as much as the uh, kind of coagulated, more gruesome style. When I saw the uh, half-dried bits um, that I could pull out of the jar and sort of spread it around, I thought that just looked a lot cooler. Um, so I did go with a bit of a darker run. Overall, the blood effect I'm fairly happy with. Uh, it seems a bit more uniform, especially on this side. I really wanted it to be more random looking. But I guess if you're kind of sawing at a limb, maybe that's something that you would see. So like I say, I'm not unhappy with it. At this point, I think I am pretty much done though. I am finally ready to call this Kandarian Dagger complete. And as for the final product, I really do like my blood spatters. I may still tweak the gore on the blade, um, but overall I consider it a success. Pretty happy with how that turned out. And here it is, of course, with the professional one, the uh, licensed copy. Now the tough part of the decision is which one goes with which display. Whichever one doesn't get displayed with the tape recorder is definitely going to go with the chainsaw. It may just get in a rotation. But overall, I love my project. I'm really happy I did it. I'm glad to have two variants of the Kandarian Dagger. And I hope this video was helpful to somebody in setting up your own uh, prop production. And one last note, even though I never met the man, I'd like to thank Rob with bookofthedead.ws and evildeadchainsaws.com. Uh, both websites are very informative and were amazing resources as I uh, worked my way through these builds. So thanks a lot to him. Check them out.